Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's Wednesday once again. Welcome to Catalog and Cocktails, presented by Datadout World. We're coming to you live from Austin, Texas, and a couple other places you'll find out in a minute. It's an honest, no BS, non salesy conversation about enterprise data management with tasty beverages in hand. I'm Tim Gasper, longtime data nerd and product guy at Data.World, joined by Juan Cicada. Hey, Tim, I'm Juan Cicada, the principal scientist here at Data.World. And as always, Wednesday, middle of the week, end of the day, time to take a break. I'm actually in San Francisco today, so it's 2 o'clock, but I started my day really early. So it's even though it's 2 o'clock, I deserve a cocktail right now. Always find uh, out a cocktail. Always, always. It's it's five o'clock somewhere, right? So, uh, and uh, I'm here in San Francisco because we're organizing these really cool, honest, no BS dinner series. So we're actually kind of taking them on the road and and having uh, really small, intimate dinners with data leaders. Uh, next week we will be, I think, in Boston, and and, and then the month will be in Atlanta. So if you're interested around that, uh, just uh, just ping me on LinkedIn. But with that. Today, oh my gosh, today's going to be so much fun because uh, it, today's one of those episodes that you realize that we could probably speak for hours and hours. I'm super excited to introduce our guest, Benny Benford, who is our the former chief data officer at Jaguar Land Rover. Benny is somebody who, uh, I think in the last couple of months, right, to, to take, taking a break and he's been taking all the stuff that he's learned and dumping them out on LinkedIn. The amount of knowledge that he's been putting out there has been literally priceless. I mean, the, the stuff that I, I share with people and people don't believe it. I'm like, dude, just go, just go look at what he's saying. I mean, he's not a million dollars, a million pounds per head. That's what you should be producing for value for data. Like anyways, we'll talk about all this stuff. Benny, it is such a pleasure and honor to have you here. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Thanks. Uh, I'm joining from the UK. It's 10 PM here. So I'm, I'm very happy to join you with, with my cocktail. Cheers. Well, let's kick it off with that. Well, what are we drinking? What are we toasting for today? Kick, kick us off. Uh, I'm drinking an old fashioned. Um, despite someone who likes disruption, there's some things that just shouldn't change. And so let's drink to that as well. Despite all the lang large language models and AI, let's keep having humans playing a role in data. They know what the context is. So to humans having a role in data. Uh, well, I have a, I'm having an old fashioned here right now, too. It's just a beautiful old fashioned. At the bar they made it here at the hotel and i'm gonna cheer say i think we don't, let's not forget that uh, it, this is all a social technical phenomena that we, we, we live that we need to understand and study and we live in this world where it's it's humans too right it's not just technology so tim what are you going to be toasting for today you know i feel a little bit out of uh, vogue here i don't have an old-fashioned but i do have an old style cocktail with a twist um, so you all may know what a Tom Collins is, right? Which is sort of gin, um, lemon, simple syrup, and some club soda. Well, this is, I call it Tim Collins, because instead of gin, it's got whiskey in it. So kind of old style, just a little different. And I'll toast to that as well. Let's keep the humans in data too. The fancy stuff is fun, but don't forget about the humans. So I love it. We, got, we got whiskey and keeping it old. <laughs> Cheers. Yep. Cheers. All right, we got our funny warm-up question today. What's your favorite buck to pass? Hmm. Anything that's admin. Um, I hate admin. So if I can get anyone else to take on the admin, I'm very, very happy. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I just can't get motivated by about anything that I don't see the purpose in it. Filling in timesheets, doing anything admin-related, I, yeah, I hate it. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll follow up with uh, doing the dishes. Like figure out somebody else to go do the dishes. Yeah, mm, <laughs> I'll, I'll cook. Yeah. I'll cook. I love to cook, but somebody else can do the dishes. Yeah, I, I like cooking as well. Uh, for me, uh, it's uh, why the cats weren't fed, and luckily I've got the kids to blame for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got a lot to go through, so let's kick it off. Uh, Benny, honest, no BS. Why is business the problem and not the data? Business has not changed at the rate that data and technology have. Like fundamentally, look at the last 10, 20 years. We've gone to the cloud. We've gone serverless. We've brought in data science. We've brought in data engineering. We've brought in analytics engineering. The, the, the rate of change is phenomenal. Business science has not moved on. The, the art of management science, how you manage a business, how you structure an organization. Peter Drucker, phenomenal individual who picked up from Ford, to look at how uh, you could learn from how Henry Ford changed manufacturing and bring those ideas to the business world, his ideas are still kind of top of the pile. We haven't changed how we're running organizations, despite the fact all of the stuff that runs organizations, the data and the technology has moved on. 
So business needs to change. Business needs to keep up. Man, Drucker, I haven't heard that word in a while. I remember in management school learning Drucker, and I think his fundamental principles were put together, what, in the, the 60s or, or when was it? I, well, he had a very long career because he, as he literally picked up from Ford, so would have would have started, I guess, in the 50s. I think he went towards the end of the century. Most people will have heard of the phrase culture week strategy for breakfast and will have seen that put on some management presentation at some stage. That's Peter Drucker. Phenomenal, phenomenal individual. Um, but uh, yeah, some of his ideas, one of his ideas was you do not put process around the knowledge worker. It's out of date. And we can, we can kind of pick up on that one a bit more. But there, there are some things that have just moved on. So, so l l l l let's take that one for example, because if I want to, if, if kind of if I step back for a second, I think the, the foundations and the fundamentals of, of different areas and different disciplines, right? It doesn't matter if it's old, right? Old is not bad if you lay this foundation and then you build upon yeah. it. So, but, so, so the foundation is, is that there was a foundation, but that foundation from the past is not the right foundation for today, or we need to be evolving or, or, or there's something else that's missing. Because I'm going to be skeptical, saying all that stuff from the old is bad. Is is this old? We got to we got to throw it away. I'm like, eh, I don't know. I mean, it was designed for the past. So I did a post on on LinkedIn to compare where data is with manufacturing pre Ford, where they just they described Ford described the era that he inherited that the average manufacturing worker spent more time finding parts and understanding the, the validity, the, the trustworthiness of the parts and getting them to work than actually doing the job, which was manufacturing, which perfectly describes how data is today. The average data person spends more time trying to find data, trying to wrangle it because it isn't fit for purpose, it hasn't come through a, a proper quality assurance processes, uh, than they do actually you know, doing their job and processing and working with data. So if we look at how businesses have been designed, they were designed for an era where technology and data brought such limitations on how you could run a business that you designed around them. So if we kind of really go back pre-computing, pre, pre almost pre-ERPs, everything was designed around paper forms and you had massive where, like systems designed to move paper around the world. Um, and all of the processes, the complexity of a process was limited to how complex you could make a paper form and how complex you could pass it around. And then we had this wonderful thing called ERPs come in, um, but it was so hard to do computing so difficult to do computing that the idea of changing an ERP from one company to another company was horrendous. So you designed a company around an ERP, it's insane. You designed how an organization should function around the capability of, of SAP, Oracle, others to design computer systems. Um, and so those processes were designed not for the organizations and what they're trying to achieve, but, but around a computing process. And get, kind of getting even closer to data, individuals work with data on their PCs. We couldn't have the idea of collaborative data sets, individuals working together on the cloud. Really, really dangerous to get an individual's access to, to servers because you give too many people access, they'll bring the damn thing down. So by nature, business is a silo. The this KPIs that every function has are different. Everyone's, most of the KPIs are done outside of systems. They're done inside spreadsheets because the they didn't have a collaborative environment to work in. So businesses were by their nature siloed and you solve problems in functional silos and then you kind of brought everyone to integrate together. All of that can be rewritten. There's no reason for silos. We can work in collaborative environments. You can look at areas where you can own your systems rather than actually uh, uh, an insane conversation. I remember once that will remain anonymous when my consulting days, um, very senior level in an organization and someone said, the first thing we need to consider when designing our organization is the fact that we're an SAP company. And that, no insult to that, that software company, amazing company. But the first thing you need to consider when you design your entire organization is a software stack? That's insane. That's completely <laughs> the tail wagging, wagging the, uh, the, the dog. So, yeah, we've got the ability to do things very, very differently now. But the world has not caught up in the slightest. We're still run in silo teams with different metrics and different functions, with processes that that uh, change the world very, very slowly when we've got the ability to move on. And if you look at those who are real digital disruptors, they're not working like that. They're working very differently. This feels like, uh, Benny, a very big frame shift. Um, and I think it's very fascinating to hear you kind of set up this whole, you know, that, that business is the problem, not necessarily data, because I think we are such in a frame of mind of technology um, first, 
around data and, oh, well, you know, it needs to be bigger. It needs to be faster. We need better tools. We need, you know, it's always about how do we create the right technology to help us unlock things. And then on top of that, when we do start to talk about process, right, let me just name something that's been buzzy lately, right, the, the concept of the data mesh, right? Even that tends to think a lot around the data and the technology and how, you know, we then map the business to that. It sounds like you're going further. It sounds like you're saying that we should actually look at the business itself and can we change the way that we're doing business or, re or organize our business in a way where, to your point of, you know, we've, uh, that businesses were designed to sort of, um, uh, uh, they were designed around technology and around data to actually, how, do, how does it actually become more of something that works symbiotically together? So is that the right way to think about that frame shift or is it a little bit different than that? It is. And one of the um, ways to, I guess, open up that mindset shift, if you encourage everyone who's listening to think of some of the most transformative data solutions that they've seen in, in, in their actual lives, rather than, you know, the, the Netflix algorithms that, that get talked about a lot, how many of them have actually used the latest cutting edge technology or actually needed to use it? Very, very few. So, we don't they, we therefore definitely don't need what's coming out this year and next year and the year after to achieve radical business change because most of the transformative solutions have used technology that was available five ten if not more years ago so therefore it, that really emphasizes that the, what's been holding it back is is the shift in in thinking and changing how you run and drive your business um and it's it's a really big shift it's an easy statement to make but i think this is so ingrained it's almost hard for me to find a way to overstate how 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 big the change is going to be if um radical statement radical belief but i think there's a significant percentage of people who are at senior levels who don't understand the purpose of the function that they're running they understand that they execute a process and they understand how that process has been designed. And we can like, you can list them at random organizations. It's kind of like, uh, and there are processes that are archaic is what you see in, in Moneyball. So Moneyball, you see scouts who choose their players based on all sorts of arch archaic outdated things that existed pre-data. And that's how you see organizations price their products, decide how many, how many volume of, of, of whatever product they want to be producing next year. Uh, deciding what they're going to launch onto the market. They have very outdated processes for doing that that come through decades of often coming off the back of systems and, and ingrained knowledge. Mm -hmm. And they think their purpose is to run that process as neatly as possible. But they've never stepped back to say, what's the purpose of that process for the organization? And now that we're in the new era, can we can rethink that entirely? So if you're looking at pricing, actually pricing may have been the way to, you know, to maintain competitiveness with your peers. Now you can run dynamic pricing. Maybe it's a way to enter entirely new markets. And the, the whole purpose of the team that you run has changed massively. So it, it's, we've got the opportunity now to where you shouldn't just be redesigning a process to improve what the purpose of that pro current process is, but to change your business model. And we should be visiting that on every major project that we look at. But that's really, really fundamental way of, of looking at the world. So th th this, this just sparked a, an interesting thought in my mind here. So, so you said something very, very critical here. It's like the, the actual senior folks in organization, they probably don't even understand kind of how the business works, right? They're like, they're almost like laying on a machine. They're running like, I gotta do this function. I gotta do this thing. I gotta do it. Why? I just got to go do that. I got to go do that. Right. So they're not actually, they're not being curious themselves to understand why we're doing that. Like we got, we got to migrate to this ERP system. It's going to migrate from Oracle to SAP or SAP, whatever. And it's cost $2 million, $3 million. It's going to take two years, whatever. Like, yeah, that's right. We got to go do people know how to go do this very well, but why are we actually doing that? How is this actually improving the business and so forth? I think, so your point is that there, there are senior folks who actually have been there for so much time that they really don't understand kind of the bigger picture. And I and, 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 and I and I can't buy that. I think people people have just been kind of in their in their silo, right? They understand their silo. They understand the people around them, but not the, not the bigger picture. I always talk about like, wait, the data the data folks need to understand how the business works, and and also kind of like the, this younger newer generation because data is a newer thing, right? The data doesn't data wasn't a thing 10, 20, 30 years ago. So 
if the younger younger you or newer generation who's focusing on data and we're telling them you need to understand the business but at the same time they're looking at their senior peers and they're like well they don't even understand the business or they think they do and they're making it so complicated so it's like in reality who actually knows what's going on somebody needs to know because the company is making money right and they're still out there so 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 i think there's like a complete disconnect of what's going on and i think th this is where i believe that we're going to go see the true leaders stand out and, and 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 i think it's it's based on empathy and based on curiosity to under to, to, to say i'm going to go the extra mile to really figure out what's going on and why and why and try to connect the dots across all these silos Com completely agree and i'd say not just under it's a real nuance but but maybe i'm nitpicking here not just understand what the business is what it can be the businesses who are doing best are the businesses that keep evolving um i, I constantly on the lookout for examples of really interesting data transformations and one that occurred to me i was getting back into cycling again i, I was and i got a, a some kit for my patechi i got some kit for my bicycle um that measures all sorts of data from garmin right and but garmin were the gps guys and, and so were TomTom, Tom, and TomTom Tom kind of were a TomTom Tom now. They still exist. I had a Google, but they're a software company that do a little bit of mapping. But, but Garmin now, they're, kind of, they're not just the GPS guys. They take data off my pedals. They take data off my heartbeat. They, take, they do all sorts. They've, they've got shipping forecast data coming in because they've just kept expanding their business and going, well, this is where we are today. What if we had new data? What services can we spin up? What else can we do? And it's not just looking at what you are, it's looking at what you can be and expanding your business. That's where the value is today. The companies who move the fastest aren't just trying to expand their penetration into a certain market. They're redefining markets all the time. And, and that's where data is at its most disruptive and most value adding is by redefining things. It's, uh, it doesn't mean it's the only thing you should be doing, but I think it's where you're going to get most of your value. I think this is hard for a lot of companies, right? Because it doesn't feel safe, right? I, I kind of go yeah. back to your comment about just running the playbook of the process as opposed to really thinking about your purpose and then let every, letting everything else pivot. Um, there's a joke that at some point somebody told me at one point, they said uh, a lot of companies like to do R&D, rip off and duplicate, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, I think that's true yeah. across every industry, right? It's safe, but just copy what everybody else does and, and your job is safe, right? So um, this seems hard. It seems like few people want to do this. And if everybody was doing it, wouldn't it be chaos? It's really hard and it's really um, vulnerable. Like the, the, there's a joke that if you don't want to get fired at a senior level, then hire some of the biggest brand name consultancies and choose technology on the Gartner Magic Quadrant and no one will ever fire you for those decisions. But it's you're also not going to really stand out, right? You're going to do the same thing as all of your competitors. And, and it's, you're a follower. You're a follower, exactly. And, it, and, and who, 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 okay, there's lots of safety in that and you can lead a nice, comfortable existence, maybe, but, but maybe there's going to be a disruptor who views things differently and really questions what the market is, what the customers need. Um, how the world's evolving, what your true, you know, do goes back to fundamentals, does a SWOT analysis, what are the strengths, what are the assets of our company, what are the opportunities, and pivots. Um, and you've got organizations, I mean, Lego is a fast, 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 fascinating example of innovative organization. They're, they made plastic toys and they now make films and have, have playgrounds and theme parks and like, organizations that continually revisit their purpose based on where they are. And from, for us, us data people, we should be not just questioning how the data that we have in our organization can support what the organization does today, how it can support new services, and how the organization we have today is in a better position than others to capture new data sets and what we could use those data sets for. We need to constantly be on the cycle for, for innovation and, and pushing things forward. I think when we were talking before, you you said something that, that really opened my eyes. Companies don't have the right to exist in the next five years. And I think this is, I think a, a lot of people believe that they're in this, uh, we just take it for yeah. granted is what we do. But, 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 but yeah, we, we need to be, we need to be ready for change because I mean, we'll talk about AI later on, but AI is coming around, right? And there's always something coming around that's going to go dramatically change things. And if you're not prepared, either ready to go be that change, be, be that change or be able to go adapt to that change your competitors will. And then that's probably why companies close down and they don't exist anymore. Yeah, I agree. That, the, the reason I said that, I, 
I had a brutal start to my career. My first job was, I mean, brutal is the wrong way, but it's, it was a very good grounding. My first job was working in business transformation, not in technology. And I started in 08. So I saw, I, I worked on the insolvencies of, of more companies than I care to remember and did more personal redundancies. It, it left me with this understanding that, yeah, the organization has the right to survive. And the rate of change, I think one of the biggest things people miss out when they talk about strategy and they talk about, can we go this way or that? Um, they forget the cost of indecision. People don't realize that not making a decision today is actually a decision to not make a decision. And probably the most expensive decision you can make in your business is to not do anything. So all of this procrastination about which direction do we move is, is it's really costly. And uh, I can't remember the statistic on what the average age businesses last is. I know, it's, I know it's something that Jeff Bezos supposedly used a lot at Amazon, regularly quoted to people the average age of a company in the in the FTSE 100 or equivalents around the world. And it's not, it, it, new entrants come in all the time. I'm just I'm Googling this right now. A recent study, well, this is the first thing that showed up. A recent study by McKinsey found that the average lifespan of companies listed in the S&P 500 was 61 years in 1958. Today is less than 18 years. Wow. McKinsey believes that in 2027, 75% of the companies currently quoted on the S&P 500 will have disappeared. This is reading the top thing that showed up here on Google. Yeah. Google for average company. So. It's, that's, this, those statistics really hit home, don't they? When, because obviously I've come from China. I actually never thought about, the, this is, this is fascinating. Gone are the days of just working at IBM for 35 years and getting your Rolex watch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Companies are like a disposable construct now. <laughs> And the skill sets, you know, the roles are all disposable. It's uh, the world moves on fast. It's both. I think companies do need to do a lot more to support their, their workforce through this. But individuals need to be looking at this and and questioning, you know, is this company going to support my route to retirement? Mm -hmm. it, you know, there's there's a lot of frameworks that try to adapt to change. Right. Agile, lean. Uh, you know, safe, things like that. Like, uh, are, are these frameworks providing value to to be able to respond to some of the disruption and be a part of some of that disruption? Or is that just like not, it, that doesn't even scratch the surface? I think Agile is, I think ag I, with a sm debate, small A or big A, Agile, some people just run off and think of, of um, Kanban boards and what have you, and there's more to it than that. But Agile with a small A, I think, has a huge role to play in that. And I think that's been recognized at a lot of board levels now. A lot of companies that I've spoken to and at the last organization I was in, the board recognized the need to move towards to an Agile organization where there's one of the changes is the teams within the organization are much more empowered to drive changes as long as they drive towards outcomes that are agreed at a senior level. And then there are mechanisms in place to agree new outcomes as well, which is very different to how organizations used to work, where top down, you, you decided what needed to be done and you received your orders about what to do. Instead, now you're told what direction you need to take people in. Um, and then you've got a local empowerment to do that. And I think data's got a huge role to play in that. Um, I, there's... There's an article that I keep meaning to write and keep feeling I've not done enough research on. So I'll, I'll, I'll say something relatively incoherent now, perhaps. But I think agile and data culture are two sides of the same coin. If you look at the articles on what does it mean to be an agile with a small A organization, what does it mean to be a data culture kind of data with a small D organization, there's a autonomy, autonomy of teams to, to kind of drive in their own direction, clarity of purpose and objectives. The Agile talks a lot about transparent access to information and metrics and backlogs so everyone can actually have a common understanding of what's going on. We've got this concept of stream aligned teams coming up. So you're not just autonomous, but, but you've got the ability to drive through a whole value process rather than owning just a, just a section and learning organizations. So I think, I think data's got almost as large a say in how we get create these organizations as, as Agile does and that they're too maybe along with how you create learning organizations is an interesting one. They're, they're, they're really big concepts that we need to push towards. Um, but it's that's my take on data, which is you know, back to our toast at the beginning, is very much around people um, and what people do with data rather than just the records themselves. 
Now, th this goes back to the, something we were discussing before about like uh, data teams themselves, right? They need to go after the business organizations. They need to shift from that uh, no because to the yes if, right? We're like, uh, what, I mean, oh, we don't have uh, a buy-in from the executives. Like, well, because you, why not? Yeah. Like, have, have you actually gone in? Like, what? You just ask once and they said no, and you stopped. Like, no. I think there there needs to be more of of this inter interaction. Like, a, the the if business traditionally has lived in these these lines of business have been in these silos, which I think that that's kind of how it traditionally has been set up. Data is coming around saying it doesn't fit in its own silo. It's something that it, that traverses all the different silos. So that's why you get all this different friction. That means that. I mean, that's a good thing, right? The friction is energy there that we're like, let, let, let's go use this for the positive. And I think uh, sometimes then we just end up in the in the in the easy space. So let me just go then work on this line of business, and then then you just end up being a re ad hoc report to a, a, a generation, which is nothing wrong with that. But you're a follower, yeah. you're not a leader. Then you end up doing the same thing we've been doing before, except with a fancier tool. There's lots of work, like cloud migrations. I have no idea why a cloud migration is a project in and of itself, but you can justify it. You can do it. You can spend some time on it. Um, there's lots of work that you can justify doing that 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 doesn't really yeah push you outside of your comfort zone and move forwards. And I think to that no because yes if mindset. I I think the world for data people has changed during COVID, but we. We haven't fully seized the opportunities yet. And what do I mean by that? If you go conferences pre-COVID when the room were polled on what your biggest challenge is, exec support was always listed as the biggest challenge from data leaders that, that I spoke to pre-COVID. It's not anymore. But yet people are still listing some of the same blockers as to why we can't drive changes. Oh, we can't push a common data platform across the organization. That's too big a change. We're going to have to re-educate everyone. We're going to have to change every, everything everyone does. So, well, well, why not? I mean, the, the chief commercial, chief customer officer forced CRMs in at one stage. The chief finance officer forced ERPs in at one stage. Surely the chief data officer can force in a chief, a common data platform across the organization. Like, surely that's not too big an ask and, and data is now at the table. So I think some, we, the board are open for those conversations now, but we're used to, we're used to shadow boxing ourselves and going, oh, we've been told so many times no one on X that, that we're going to get told no again. I think we, it's time for, for data leaders to make very bold asks and to, to justify their seats at, at the C-suite and at the board level. Make your bold asks, push those things forward. I think this is, this is fascinating. And, you know, I think one thing that would be helpful, Benny, is, you know, if you could talk a little bit about your own journey that you've gone through and, how you know whether you know as your role at CDO at um, at Jaguar Land Rover or at some of the other experiences you've had, how you've you know faced these challenges and what you've seen work well and not work well. So I'm going to have to admit that I've learned a lot of lessons along the way. So all of the stuff I'm saying now I didn't necessarily do along the journey, but this is how I've got there. So my background, I mean, I was I had a technical background. I studied operational research at university, so I always had an interest in how you could use math to, to shape the world. Um, did business transformation, as I said, came across data when I was working in consulting, loved it, but got frustrated as a consultant that you're limited on what change you can drive. So I tried to find an organization where I'd get the opportunity to test how far can we go with data. Um, I always had this kind of question in my head of why is everyone using Excel? It just feels so out of date. So how can we change that? I mean, Excel's Excel is older than me. It's probably older than both of you as well. Excel's as, Excel is as old as the Sony Walkman, right? Who you still use as a Sony Walkman. So, um, so this question of how can we completely change everything? Um, I'm not interested in cars still, and I wasn't then, but uh, got a lucky career break joining Jaguar Land Rover because uh, of who I got to work for, the person who's now CEO. Uh, they became chief transformation officer and they'd be given the remit to set up a data team. And that was my big career break. Um, they were deputy CFO at the time. So we got, which you've alluded to, Juan, given the target, um, when I came in and started the team, we got given the target to get a million pounds return per person per annum because it was a CFO moving into a chief transformation role, um, which, I'll be honest, sounded insane. Uh, and uh, it really pushed the those of us in that team at the time, the, the, a number of people in the leadership team 
I think it's really important to have a diverse leadership team to do the, take on these type of broad tasks. So whether that was possible or not, but really put, pushed us to think about, well, if you are going to get those types of returns, what are the value drivers in a business? And unsurprisingly, it's it's understanding revenue, it's understanding management of your working capital, which is goes to forecasting. Some of the biggest returns early on came from improving forecasting, improving the margin by looking at the mix of vehicles. You, you really push on well, where does it make sense to spend time? Uh, and some of the things that people speak about are projects you get to eventually, but they're not going to be those massive, massive hits. Like predictive maintenance is, is a great project, but on, on one machine is not going to change a business. So it really pushed us to look at that. My role then shifted to uh, an interesting challenge. I, I had a bit of a career setback. I didn't get the, the promotion I was looking for at the time. I said, what do you want me to do now? And the response came, well, you've shown you can get value from central data teams. Can we get value from everyone who's doing data work in the organization? Which was a really interesting challenge. Didn't really know what I was doing to start with, uh, but formed a team to do that. Um, the biggest recommendation I'd give to everyone is to survey your organization. If you are in charge of data strategy, you need to be really, really humble and assume you know maybe 2% of what's happening with data in your organization. So get a really wide community base and get them to tell you the problems. That was fascinating. So then we had data to tell us around uh, why the rest of the organization was struggling to get value from data and could prioritize what we solved. Worked on that for a while. It was mostly an evangelist role and then got the career break to move to CDO. And some of the pushes that I speak about now, um, some of them were things that I advocated for. Some of them were were feedback from, from the board. Uh, I remember, so I talk about data platforms. I remember going to a presentation to, to make a business case for more investment in data platforms. And um, the response came, we get it. You've spoken to us about this many times before. When are we going to finish rolling it out? And that was sort of manner from heaven. So we then approach things differently and look at how you can complete a data rollout. And I don't think that conversation happens enough in the data sector. So that's kind of my background. Um, uh, and then recently, yeah, moved, decided to move on to, or we'll get to that later on to it's what I'm working on now, but that was my background at JLR. Yeah. I, I would love to go into the, the, the million kind of the million pounds per person. You wrote this post a while back about how you were actually calculating that like this would be great for our listeners to see like all right this sounds crazy which by the way this was another thing that we chatted about before is yeah. like you need to have these crazy things because if the moment somebody says they can't do it but somebody says oh i'm gonna go do it and they do it then never suddenly everybody can start to go do that right lots of the constraints are, are, are artificial they're, they're what we think they are so the thing you're alluding to there's a i don't know if people have heard of it but the four minute mile so the first time someone ran the four minute mile, everyone said it was impossible. Uh, and then someone called Roger Bannister ran the four minute mile, who wasn't, he wasn't the elite athlete. He wasn't the one winning all the competitions, but he ran a four minute mile. And the year after he ran a four minute mile, so many other people ran one because it was suddenly that, oh, it's possible. And, and so it's a mental switch. And I think we work with what, most of the time we work with what's possible. And if you get given a ridiculous target, you get to challenge, well, what is possible? So, <laughs> The calculation, it, it's simple at the end of the day. It's, it's business benefits. So broadly speaking, all of the uh, large ticket items either came from cash was saved. So you'd reduce the amount of stock that was stored in the company, either finished vehicles or stock in terms of inventory by improving processes. That's measurable. You know the stock levels before and afterwards. Uh, and then there was an attribution which I'll come back to in a second, or it came from improving profit, profitability by taking expense out or looking at margin of, of, of things that were sold. So the, um can speak about this because there's some awards were won for this. The largest project, which I wasn't the one leading, someone else was leading, was a recommended order bank um, that looks at specifying all of the vehicles in different markets that helps you to set, you know, exactly how many vehicles should be the premium vehicle, exactly how many should have all of these features. You can get the margins of the vehicles right. And you can measure the, mar the, the margin before and afterwards since you know the value. And then there was an attribution, which was if the, the analytics, the data product alone had delivered all of the results, which is rare, but does happen, then as a team, we were allowed to claim 100% of the benefits. If it was um, a case that the data analytics products needed a, a significant business change off the back of it. It was seen as 50-50. Uh, 
any of the data analytics project was seen as an enabler amongst a bunch of other things. There were, there were new systems brought in, there was also business change, so there were other things going on, then, then we got 20% of the benefits, um, if I remember right. And, then, and it, just, it's, it doesn't have to be scientific. You, you're looking at a business lever that changes, profit, revenue, amount of stock that you've got, and you need an attribution mechanism. And the, the phrase we often used when we had debates agreeing this at the beginning, and you will find arguments of, well, the profits improved, but the markets changed as well. The phrase we often use is, well, do we want to weigh the pig or do we want to feed the pig? We can spend all of our analytics time measuring our impact because that uses analysts up, or we can spend all of our analytics time trying to drive impact, and you want to be somewhere in between the two. So let's, let's go with crude measurement and lots of impact over very precise measurement and not much impact. I love that. It's, uh, you have, sometimes we you get have, too obsessed with the details about yeah. things that we lose the bigger picture and the goal is to drive behavior. Yes. Yeah. Do you have, a, I'm curious, do you have an accountant to look at the stuff or, or this was just your own calculation, like your, your team's calculation? I am an accountant. This is something I've been talking For my sins, I am an accountant. Um, well, <laughs> no, so, are, oh, so I've been bringing this up a lot. I, 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 there, there was, I, I mean, there's a podcast I listened a while ago who brought about who said like, oh, you should bring an accountant to the team. And I've been bringing this up with a lot of folks, and they're like, what? What do you mean? I'm like, but you, your evidence that we need to have accounting. And is it scaled? So there were a couple of people in the team who were accountants, and it really helped. We actually ran training on accounting for the whole data team. So I, I think I think it's essential. I think you should train anyone who's trying to get value from a business to at least understand the accounts and to understand difference between things like profit and cash flow and what it means to have depreciation, just basic things like this. Um, but but as we scaled, the, the finance team became really important. There was a team in finance that actually audited our results that gave validity. Uh, they helped with some of the more complex analysis so they could take on some of the work. But uh, yeah, I think it's really important to train uh, teams that are trying to drive value on the science of value, which in, in some ways is accounting. And the science of value, which is all right. So what, we we got some, we got so more stuff to cover before we wrap up. But you are doing something new, uh, which what is interesting is that it's it's a nonprofit startup, nonprofit. What 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 is this? What what does the world need right now that you are trying to go change with this nonprofit? So, what did I get frustrated about that caused me to leave? Because it was a lovely role. Um, I my experience was that there is no natural partner on the market for data transformation, um, and talk through that. Then then there's a couple other problem statements that come off this. You've got lots of tech companies out there and they're brilliant, but no technology alone supports a data transformation. You need a suite of them. And it's not the role of any technology company to understand how you put your whole suite together. And you don't need just technology. So the technology companies aren't, aren't in the position to be uh, ideal transformation partners. There's also this really weird thing that because of the world is run by VC and investment these days, your, multi, your, your value multiplier is much higher for a SaaS company than a services company. So therefore, SaaS companies don't want large services arms to help for transformation. So they, they can't help. The consultancies, little con controversial opinion maybe, but I, I tested this one on a LinkedIn poll, and I think 87% agreed. The consultancies, a lot of them have become conflicted because they want to sell data services. Therefore, to try and help you on a data transformation where your company is very good at doing data services itself and is self-sufficient, there's a conflict of interest. So they're not they're not natural partners for helping to run a data transformation. So this was a gap that I noticed. So I initially thought, well, I'll leave and I'll start up a consultancy to help to provide that service. Um, and then I very quickly realized as I looked at the market, oh my God, the market is overwhelmed with noise. We have so many data startups over out competing each other with new terminology that Again, did a LinkedIn poll on this, um, and the, the vast majority of people agree the amount of constant new terminology and data is a problem. It's making it harder for people to move into this area. It's making it harder to have stable strategies, and it, you need to run through a long-term strategy. So, uh, and that's the result of an over-competitive market. And then the, the final problem statement I realized as kind of looking at this is, well, data is not yet a profession, and, and this is part of the problem. So all of the thought leadership's coming from tech companies and consultancies, Tech companies, they do produce some thought leadership. They also produce marketing, and sometimes you can't tell the difference. Uh, and 
the consultancies similarly they're trying to sell their products there's no it, it's not a profession and if you're going to try and set up something that's going to change this dynamic no one is going to com is going to collaborate and it, it needs to be a collaborative effort with a profit making entity so the gap is there needs to be a non-profit that starts to drive collaboration um in the market so that we do have common standards so that companies can accelerate their their trans the rate of their transformation um and that's i've got a white paper which i've shared with yourself one i'm happily to share with people that reach out um that i was sharing last quarter that goes through a number of these problem statements and other, other others that fall off it but essentially that uh setting up a non-profit to start to standardize not the technical aspects there are non-profits looking at things like stand new standards around graphs great don't don't question it needed superb there are entities looking at some of the ethics increasing ethics in the data sector great again superb there's no one looking at business management and how it changes and how do you manage a data transformation how do you support organizations to do that um, and at jlr we we worked with a couple of other companies who were doing similar things there was so much that we were doing in common and there was no mechanism for sharing this knowledge so develop the body of knowledge for data transformation and then running data-driven organizations and do that in a non-compete way as a professional body would do. That's what I'm looking at setting up next. Yeah, what, what I find what I find that is important with the, of the work that you're doing is that this is uh, th this is kind of the repeatable playbook in a way that yeah. that it's the playbook itself is not competitive like that com that's not competitive for a company like people should be looking at this and it's not one playbook that was probably depending on the industry depending on your size you're trying to go do different ways of doing that uh if we all kind of are heading in the right direction then we won't be wasting our times doing the next migration to the next sap thing without knowing <laughs> what business we're what is our business function right otherwise we'll going to keep uh, reinventing the wheels but with um I don't know, data is going to be in, not in the cloud, but I don't know, in the, in the space or whatever. And I think, I agree. And I think that the transformation needs to be led by people with, within a business. So there's a lot of analogy with something like Lean Six Sigma. Lean Six Sigma was a standard. Lots of organizations were set up to train Lean Six Sigma experts within organizations. And then they drove through the continual improvement changes. Uh, one of the, the gaps I saw on the market is anything. I, I know lots of people from business backgrounds who want to know how to make their function more data driven. There's nothing to help them do that in a way that is tech agnostic and then gives them access to a continuing evolving body of knowledge, which is what a profession is. It's um, by starting to professionalize data itself, which which is another thing we spoke about. Yeah. Well, there we we can continue talking just on this topic for another hour or so forth, but we're going to start doing this uh, brand Rapid new fire. segment. Mm. Brand new segment. I'm starting today. First time we just decided yesterday we're going to go do this. Before we did the, the mesh minute, I think we're done with data mesh. Uh, let's go do AI is on everybody's mind. GPT, LLMs, right? All this stuff. One minute to rant about AI. You got your AI minute. Ready? Set, go. One minute. In my view, large language models are kicking off the largest theft in human history. It's it's fascinating. So IP is kind of weird anyway. Could spend 10 minutes on this. IP is very rigid in things like music, less rigid on things like written text. But our large language models have just gone out there and said it's all ours. We're not telling you whose data we've consumed, but we've consumed it and we're going to repurpose it. We're not going to credit you. That's not what happened previously with ideas. If you wrote an academic paper, if you wrote a, uh, wrote a good book, you'd credit where it came from. Okay, maybe it's changing. Bard says it can credit some of its sources. ChatGBT can't. But there's there's certainly a lack of accountability and transparency in there. Um, and it's it's centralizing ownership of this in a way that's, that's really quite scary. So what do I think is going to happen next? Because I've got to spend a minute on this and I keep got to keep talking. There's going to be legal battles and uh, organizations need to look at how they can start to run their own LLMs and, and, and maintain their own data. I'm done. Beautiful. This was a, an awesome kickoff for the first <laughs> segment. Uh, I did not know where you were, where you were going to go with this. And, and uh, I agree with you. Yeah. And I You were just... Yeah, it feels that way. It feels that way. It's uh, there's no 
there's no accreditation for all of the IP that they've taken to create their assets. Excellent point. Well, they're going to get sued, but they're planning for it. Yeah, <laughs> we, we talked a lot about disruption today, and obviously there's a massive disruption here, and uh, you know some some folks don't know how to react to that. Italy just banned GPT, right? Yeah, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Um, see how that evolves. Because if if, <laughs> if, it, if it does produce productivity enhancements, that's a brave thing for a country to do. So, yeah. all right. Well, with that, let's uh, let's kick it off uh, with our lightning round presented by Data that World. So I'll go first. CDOs shift more resources and power to them and their org. I uh, no. No, the, the resources should be away from the CDO's org. The org should be decentralized. Data should be in the functions. The CDO should be an orchestration role. OK. Nice. Strong opinion there. Um, second lightning round question. The management Bible, Peter Drucker, the rewritten. Yes, 100%. Um, we need to find a brave CEO that's going to experiment with how to run an organization and, and then retest how to run organizations. All right. Uh, third question, are all companies becoming data and technology companies? No, they don't all need to. I had an interesting conversation with someone the other day around, we need to stay confidential, but around a kitchen organization, a kitchen fitting organization that couldn't care less about its data. It's massively profitable. It has great carpenters, it's expanding vastly. It doesn't need to worry about data. There's plenty of industries that don't need to worry about their data. Just, right. just to explain all that one a, a, a bit, you said plenty of industries that don't need to. Like, I, I'm curious, can you expand on that? What other industries you would say, like, yeah, no. I mean, does does a hot dog van need to worry about its data? Like, there's there's lots of places. Anywhere, I mean, hot dog van's a weird one choice. Maybe it does. Anywhere <laughs> where you've got high margin and it's craft and you're, you're expanding and you have demand from what you're doing, you don't need to refine your process. So the, so the craft area does not need to worry about data at all. That is interesting. Very insightful. You're a, you're a very I'd wise like to, I like to unpack the economics of different industries at some point and just think about how disruption affects them differently. But that's that's the data nerd in me. All right. Uh, fourth lightning round question for you. Um, so fast forward five years from now. We like to do some of these future, future casting uh, questions sometimes. So five years from now, are businesses more successful at being data driven and channeling this disruption? Or are they more in chaos and disrupted? Both. The ones, the ones with the higher growth and higher margins are more successful. Um, the ones with the higher mental health problems of their workforce are less successful. <laughs> this is what you, I, you speak to so many people who are burning out right now because their organizations are trying to do everything. And I've spoken to CDOs who go, oh, my God, my CEOs just heard about chat GPT and AI and now wants to do these 15 things. You need focus. Organizations that have focus will succeed. Those who stay scattered will end up stressed and, and chaotic. I think that's a statement that will transcend the test of time. So that one will focus. focus. Yeah, I, it's just a tautology, I suppose, isn't it? <laughs> well, it would I'm be sure, excited in a sure, newly written management book. I'm sure Peter Drucker talks about that, so that part, 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 that part wouldn't get rewritten. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. There will be plenty of Drucker that stands the test of time. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we have so much notes here. Uh, Takeaway time. Tim, take us away. All right. Such a great conversation today. We really started things off with this honest question about, you know, business versus the data, right? Uh, which one's the problem? Uh, and uh, you really started us off, Benny, by saying that the business hasn't changed nearly as much as the rate of technology, right? The art of running the business continues to be largely the same for, you know, 70 plus years, right? Um, you don't put process around the knowledge worker and all these things that were developed as part of the original management methodologies by Peter Drucker and others. They haven't evolved to the new times. They don't all apply to the new times. And uh, many of these ideas don't fit into a world that we live in today where technology, data, and society is evolving at such a rapid pace. Um, it was designed for the past. Ford kind of described that the average manufacturing worker spent all their time looking for parts. Uh, you talked about, uh, you know, the worrying about the finding the parts, the quality. 
amusingly kind of similar to the world of data today. Um, and uh, businesses were designed for an era where technology uh, and data would be designed around instead of in conjunction with. And so you mentioned, you know, paper, everything revolved around the paper processes. And then ERP came around and the business just did everything around the ERP. Uh, so you designed your company around the technology. But things are changing. Business lines uh, used to be more siloed and run independently. Now there's new metrics, new processes and, uh, and a lot of disruption. Uh, how many of the most successful companies are, are really leveraging bleeding edge, uh, te bleeding edge technology or algorithms? Uh, less than we might think. And actually, they're leveraging um, uh, it to disrupt as opposed to um, uh, to really. It's not the technology that's the factor that's driving their success. It's the disruption in the business model and how they're applying those disruptive approaches. Right. Um, you mentioned that uh, purpose needs to be at the center. Uh, that a significant percentage of people at the senior level probably don't actually understand the purpose of their function. Um, and all they're doing is they know what the process is, or at least what they've been told the process should be and how it should operate. And they're just following out that process, right? They're just running the playbook they know instead of thinking about truly what is their purpose and trying to uh, disrupt themselves and disrupt the market. You mentioned, you know, Garmin, right? They're not just a GPS company. They're like an IoT data company. Uh, like look at Lego, right? They're not a plastic piece, plastic toy manufacturer. They're an entertainment company, right? And so it's really thinking about how you can change the game around these things. And really this centers around not the technology and the data, but around the business itself. Uh, and then you mentioned about there's all these strategy problems, right? The average life of a company is, is reducing, um, and uh, people often um, uh, the, the worst decisions that a company or that people could make is is actually indecision. Analysis paralysis is probably the greatest cost of the business. Um, and agile and data culture are really two things that can help a lot. And they're two sides of the same coin. Uh, and you mentioned autonomy, clarity of purpose. Uh, transparent access to information, stream aligned teams, which being in a, a, from a product background, I'm very passionate about. So I'm excited to hear you mention that. Uh, uh, learning organizations, shifting from no because to yes if. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of opportunity here for us to change the game around um, strategy, company strategy, like you talked about. So much more, but Juan, I'm going to pass the baton over to you. Yeah, so we, we talked about your experience at, at JLR, and and uh, I, li I like this. Excel is as old as the Sony Walkman, but who's using the Sony Walkman anymore, right? I think those those are the types of things we need to be looking at. And again, I'm, I, I love this whole million pounds per person. And, and I mean, anybody who's listening, go go find a post about this or just, or just ping me and I'll, I'll, I'll link it to you. Uh, how do you do this? Well, you got to understand how this cash is being saved, how to reduce this. Uh, how do you save cash, right? I'm going to reduce the stock. You could, you can do the before and after. You can see how much of that, right? If I'm going to go improve profit, I, I could take expenses out. I can look at the margins around this. So you had this whole uh, kind of th these metrics, right? You take like 100% of, of the credit there if it was all done by the data products. 50% it was done between kind of half and half between the data and the business. 20% if you know that it, you're part of that change. Um so don't get obsessed with all the details around this stuff. Like we got to be very practical about it. And uh, we should have an account. Accounting should be part of the team. And in your, your case, you're actually, accounting is your background, right? So we need to, we need to understand profit, understand cash flow, understand the science of value, which is accounting. Uh, have a diverse leadership team. Uh, understand what are the value drivers, how understand how revenue, understand how to improve forecasting, uh, to understand where you should be spending some time survey the organization. I love this so much because I bring this up time and time again, right? I, I, my, my broken record, a data catalog is not just about cataloging data. It's cataloging data and knowledge. Understand how people are doing things in the organization. Let them to tell you what the problem is. And the status quo is to focus so much on what is possible. People said the four-minute mile was not possible until somebody did it. And then somebody, then everybody started to go do that. Um, so and then what's next for you and not just for you, but I think what needs to, what's next for the entire data world in general is like, there is no natural partner in the market for a data transformation. The majority of the people believe that consultancies are conflicted, right? They want to advise you how to do a transformation, but they also want to go implement it for you. So they're not natural partners. Another issue is that data is not a profession. Like there, we're still su such a young thing and that is a problem. So we have this big gap 
of a collaboration. And I think you need to be able to have a, a way to bridge this gap and it needs to be in, in, in this nonprofit uh, way. Uh, and, and this is not to go standardize technical aspects. Uh, people are not looking at how to just call standardize the, the playbooks around how to do business data transformation. And this knowledge is really not being uh, shared and we need to be able to kind of make sure that's repeatable. How did we do? Anything we missed? I, I'm exhausted by listening to that. So if we got all through, through all of that, that was impressive. Well, that was all you. It was, uh, it's, it's, it's been a good chat. It's been really, really good fun. We said a lot of good things. Yeah. So let's just throw it back to you to wrap it up on advice. Uh, throw three questions. What's your advice about data, about life? Uh, who should we write next? And what resources do you follow? Uh, advice, diversity, diversity, diversity. It's, it's like, it's, so simple. I think it's so easy to become absorbed in your profession, particularly an area that's moving as fast as data, that that's all you read about. Read about everything. Read about history. Read about other domains. Speak to people from other areas. I learn so much from, from reading about other areas. And one of the things that fascinates me is reading about other transformations, like the Japanese uptake of technology after World War II. Fascinating thing to learn about when you're looking at technology change today. So, so diversity there. Diversity in your teams. The, the biggest lesson I learned at JLR was not just to recruit data people in the data team, recruit people from change backgrounds with no data experience because they're going to teach you so much more about change than someone from a data background. So diversity is, is the advice. I'm going to cheat on people to invite because I couldn't narrow down to one. Um, I think you know both of these people, Juan, but Bethany Lyons, uh, superb. Uh, my brain always explodes when I have a conversation with her around data. Um, she was already, she was already, she's already been on the podcast. Well, then I'm not cheating. I need to listen to her podcast, uh, in which case uh, I'm going to flatter my former boss uh, and say Harry Powell, um, a phenomenal data science mind uh, who also understands business very, very well. Um, and uh, he was he was the guy in charge when we had the million pound target. So he'd be a good person to bring him in. And he's thinking very, very deeply around the world of graphs at the moment. And in terms of what resources, I read a lot. I read. I love reading books. I still think there's so much value in books that you don't get from, from online articles. Um, but then that, that's uh, read Medium. LinkedIn, my biggest learning so far this year is LinkedIn is a two-way medium. So as I've started putting stuff out there, people have reached out to me and I've, I've created time each week for half an hour conversations. And I think that's priceless. So, so comment on LinkedIn, uh, reach out to people and find out time to just start chatting to people. Hundred percent with you on, on, on the the LinkedIn the two way medium right I've met so yep. many amazing people with that, um, and and with that actually, next week is one of the people who are, one of our guests next week is going to be Veronica Durgan who's a VP of data at Saks who I've also met through LinkedIn and we've chatted through that and we're, that and we're actually going to be live from Boston because next week we're going to be in Boston um, for our honest no BS dinner over there so she's one of our guests so we're going to figure figure that one out how to do the whole live thing but. Um, Benny, thank you so much for this amazing, valuable conversation. I agree with Michael, who just said this was an incredible conversation. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you for the opportunity.